Do you want a new start? Ah, yeah, there's the voice, Joe. <laughs> so there's the voice. You may have a prompt. You may or may not have a prompt. If you have, then please, uh, obviously, if you want to stick around, uh, press continue. And you can still, you can still uh, switch your video off. Yep, you, you can still turn your camera off if you don't want to be appearing on the actual uh, recording. So I'll hand over to Hugh now. Great. Well, I hope everyone can see the screen. Can you see that all right, Joe? Yes, yes. we can. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, look. Honestly, welcome everybody. It's it's amazing to have so many people at our, our, our what we see as our regular monthly meeting. And, and normally it's quite an intimate affair. You know, we have maybe 20, 30, 40 people, but we've had a lot of interest in this. And I think this is a testament to, to the, um, the, the, the renown of our speaker tonight, Wolfgang Steinecker. Um, but look, just to give you a little intro about tonight, firstly to say, because there are so many people, we can't really open up the, the, the sort of voice and video like we normally do. Um, so if you have questions or comments to make, please just leave them in the chat. And what we'll do is at the end of Wolfgang's talk, Joe and I will just sort of pick out some of the questions and Wolfgang will hopefully answer them for you at the end of his talk. But look, hosts for tonight's meeting, that's us, the Wells and Mended Astronomers. Um, we're one of the sort of regular astronomy groups that, that populate the whole of the UK. Um, and and our, our, our base is, is the beautiful... Um, uh, Cathedral City of, of Wells. And here's, here's a, a photo I took of the west front of Wells bathed in the evening sunlight. If you've never visited the little town, the city, but it's a city really, it's, it's, it's England's smallest city, little city of Wells here in Somerset, please, please come and visit when you can because it is beautiful. Um, and uh, yeah, we, 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 we use Wells as our sort of HQ, the museum, which is just next to the cathedral that you can see. Um, but we observe all over the Mendips, which is a range of hills that separates Wells from its sort of sister town, if you like, of Bath, across the other side of the Mendips. Um, and, and we have meetings and, uh, and observing sessions all over the Mendip Hills. Uh, and, and the skies are really quite nice and dark. Um, although I, this is slightly unusual for our monthly meeting because we have such a big audience, I'm, I'm not gonna do a, a kind of long intro like we would normally do where we talk about what's in the sky and, and other events. But I would just like to say for, for our members who are on tonight, just a reminder of our next meeting, which is Friday the 9th of July, when we have Paul Money, who's a very well-known national as astronomy speaker. And he's gonna give us a technical talk, actually, a, a guide to simple astrophotography. So please make a note of that in your diaries. We'll send out the Zoom link shortly, or you can get it off our website. Um, we, 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 when, when I thought about this meeting, we, we, we organized it jointly, actually, with our friends in Bath, Bath Astronomers, uh, chaired by Simon Holbeach. Um, and, and I think through the connections with Bath, um, we've, we've, we've had a, 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 a sort of strong recognition and I think a lot of publicity through the Herschel Society. And of course, you know, based here in Wells and Bath, you know, William Herschel feels very much, you know, like a, a friend, a local lad. And I think that certainly helped, uh, you know, develop a lot of interest in, in Wolfgang's talk tonight, which is fantastic. Um, and of course, also Bath is the home of the um, Herschel uh, Museum of Astronomy, which is the, the, the sort of second home of William Herschel in Bath, um, where he moved from number seven to number 19. And of course, it's in the back garden of, of, of this house where he discovered Uranus, as Wolfgang may mention. Um, but to come to tonight's talk, uh, I, I got the inspiration for this when um, I, I read the spring issue of the, the Herschel Society's journal, and I'm a member of the Herschel Society as, as well. Um, and, and in, in the, the journal was, was this absolutely fascinating article by Wolfgang talking about some of the early observational work of William Herschel. And, and when I finished reading this, I thought it would be fantastic because of the local connections to, to the Herschels if Wolfgang came and give us, gave us a talk. And, and that's really what set us on this road and what's led to tonight. So honestly, Wolfgang, it's a really great welcome. You've, you've drawn a huge audience, um, an international audience, I understand. So I'm gonna hand over to you and, and we are absolutely um, dead keen to hear from you. Really looking forward to it. So good evening, Wolfgang. Yeah, hi. Hi all. Um, I don't know, uh, when I'm speaking, I'm in the foreground, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Yes, not, you, you are. Not, so. not really. You are. <laughs> I think ah, yes, yes, that's me. <laughs> that's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seems so. Okay. Um, yes, I will show the front cover of my talk, if it's possible. Uh, just try. 
You see it? You see it? Not yet, no. Hugh. Not yet. Wolfgang. Okay. So I must uh, again. So you need to share it. For yeah, I'll yeah. share it now. There now, you go. Uh, yeah, it's working. So now I change to the full screen. So it's now the full screen and I hope everybody can see it. And yeah, welcome again. And um, just a second uh, slide will yeah, cover a little bit of my person and research uh, over the years. And let's start with the uh, theme here, William Herschel, discoverer of the deep sky and uh, the epochal work of the greatest visual observer and his talented sister, Caroline. So we have actually two persons now in the center of my talk. And that's my name here. Yes, I have a PhD and FRS. And now we have uh, Bath or somewhere around that in June 20, uh, 21. And the picture to the left uh, is um, William, some kind of riding the telescope. And this is a picture yeah, made uh, around 1784 at Datchet. I, I mention it because uh, later we see another picture and uh, I will comment on that, that picture and refer to this uh, starting picture here. So I just go to the next slide. You see the next slide all? Oh, okay. Yes, yes we do. Yeah, yes, we do. fine. So if any problems, please react or send me what, what I have to do now. Um, just start with the content and uh, yeah, we start indeed with the all observations. I just uh, um, wrote about in the magazine of the Herschel Society and uh, star reviews are the major point of that thing. And now, then we start to the great sweep campaign, of course, and it's around telescope methods and sky coverage. And then we go to observations and the discovered objects. And then the later years, the final years up to his death in 1822. Uh, and then at the end, a bit about statistics and summary. Here are the major um, persons here, William Herschel and Carolyn Herschel. And now I'm the person which comes now into the game. And uh, what I present are the results of many years of research. And many of the results I present here are new. There are some other people searching on Herschel, like Michael Hoskins, good friend of mine, of course, and some other people. But yeah, maybe Dreyer was the one in, in the past who uh, go much or very deep into the substance of the, the origin origin documents. Uh, Michael is more a person um, covering family affairs, not the objects or not the astronomical content of these things. That's my my talk. And uh, the work is based on a large amount of data. Um, there is a Royal Astronomical Society's DVD set and a lot of files, a lot of files. And uh, I have also digitized all the primary sources, uh, the data content of that. And there are manuscripts, notes, letters, publications. And uh, I had developed a special analysis, analysis tool or many tools, uh, creating lists, graphics, statistics, relations between the data and so on and so on. And that took me, <sighs> more than 10, 15 years. I started in my early career about 1967 in observing some deep sky objects. And that took me over 50 years of observing. And that was very helpful to understand the work of the Herschels. I can follow his things. He's, it's, it's documented in the, in the, in the many sources. And, and I can imagine what he saw and I, I have same impression in my mind or uh, simulate some observations of him with my telescopes up to 20 inch of aperture. And so I'm very familiar with the uh, observational content of all these things here. Uh, this is the basis. And yeah, I'd like to turn to Dreyer and the NGC. My last slide will show the, the most recent books about these uh, subjects. And yeah, helpful to understand the work of the Herschels. So I start now with the early sources uh, William had uh, in his uh, small library at the beginning. And the major things were Ferguson's astronomy book and Smith's two volume uh, optic book. The first one more, more theoretical background and the other more the optical and, and technical or telescope or instrumental background uh, for making his own uh, 
yeah, optics and, and telescopes and so on. Yes. Um, then uh, might be not not very much known source is the uh, or the two maps uh, uh, made by John Senex and John Harris. Um, the northern and southern maps, here's the northern map, and they show in detail the stars from Bayer, from the Uranographia and Flamsteed, of course, and Halley. And that was the basic stuff he had uh, with him at the telescope or in preparation of the things he wanted to observe in the early days. Uh, later, uh, it was enhanced with the British catalog of stars by Flamsteed and his Atlas Celestis, both were published after his death. And um, Yes, in in um, yeah, driven by by Halley and and some other people. Uh, Messier catalog was another source essential for William's uh, deep sky observations, of course. And uh, finally, uh, in the case of double star observations, uh, Christian Meyer's double, first double star catalog. Uh, it was the first of all uh, double star catalog, and then William um, made his own two uh, things uh, a, a bit later and based on, on observations of Meyer, uh, partly. So I just uh, go to the early observations, uh, and the range is 1774 and 1783. These are all made in Bath. And uh, uh, the earliest uh, thing uh, dated one, two, and three or four March, uh, small error, one, three, one, two, and fourth of March, 1774. Um, and here we see the back garden, a backyard of his uh, new King Street house there. It's still in this condition, and the Arsenal Museum is in that house, and they can visit this backyard. Uh, there was a Newtonian the first time of 5.5 foot. Uh, uh, focal length and 4.5 inches uh, aperture, and it has around a power of around 40 times. And here's a nice picture I've seen, maybe you've seen in the literature, which is completely ridiculous <laughs> because there was no uh, solid tube uh, Newtonian at that time, never had such a telescope. And uh, also, Caroline was not beside him, and maybe this uh, will tell us how it, it's, it's in the evening or the night when Uranus was discovered. It's just ridiculous. I cross it out here. No? Yeah. It's not needed. So now we have his first journal and his own writing says about March 4 to f 1 to 4, uh, some entries here. It starts with an entry of about uh, of Saturn and he says, Just add on. Uh, the other thing uh, seen in the um, on fourth March and uh, on and first and fourth March, it was the Orion nebula, and he tells us that he has seen a lucid a lucid spot in Orion sword, and uh, it was not in Dr. Smith's uh, book or has not. Uh, it, 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 sorry, it is in Dr. Smith's book, but his own impression, which you see in the, the uh, drawing or sketch uh, below, uh, was not uh, such like uh, the, the picture in the optics book. The picture is due to uh, Huygens, and um, that was a reason for Herschel to speculate about changes in the Orion Abel because it was so different. His impression was so different as that uh, Huygens made in 1656. And, um, if you compare a modern image, a very rough one, I have took out a very bad one <laughs> to see the, the same uh, delineations here, or same uh, renderings here. And you see the major stars here and the triple, is, actually it's, uh, are four stars in Tete or Orionis in the center. And he has seen three of that. And the fourth star can, came later. He saw the trapezium later. And the, main, the name trapezium is due to Herschel uh, at that time. So. Now we have the first impression of a, a deep sky or non-stellar object is in Nebula in Orion later catalogued by Messier as M42. We all know that, I think. That are the first entries in his uh, uh, early journal number one. Um, it's the end journal is number 11. 
or number 12, it's split in two, two parts, number 12. And this is only one series of much of many documents he and, and uh, later Caroline wrote down, uh, there are many series, and that's uh, one of the large, um, yeah, material we have now, uh, we have to look into and to understand all what Herschel has seen. Yes, now we came to Herschel's early telescopes. Um, and uh, this is uh, one of the first, after the 4.5 uh, foot telescope, this is a 10 foot telescope with nine inches aperture. Uh, like the, oh, this is the typical construction of the, all these smaller Herschel telescopes in these box shaped uh, stand here. Um, this is quite different with the, with the pole mountain. They uh, are hanging, or just telescope tube is hanging at the pole here from the top. And you need a ladder to, to step on uh, to reach the eyepiece there. It's a 20 foot uh, telescope with 12 inches aperture. And here you see the box uh, where the um, um, mirror is uh, located, and uh, through uh, yeah some ropes or so, some some mesh candle things, you can shift the bottom of the telescope to the left or to the right, you know, to follow some objects. This was a tricky observation with this long tube and uh, on the ladder in a dark dark night. Later, he asked uh, Caroline to observe double stars with this thing, and Caroline uh, was not uh, willing to do it. <laughs> yeah, of course, that's not a good story here. Uh, this is a typical seven-foot telescope, the Uranus telescope, where he discovered it. We'll see later. And it has a mirror of 6.5 inches diameter. All mirrors are, as we know, um, with um, or from from a speculum uh, metal uh, shaped mirrors here of an alloy of uh, thin and uh, uh, bronze. Yes, now we came to the star reviews. That was the center of, of Herschel's early observations and in the center were double stars. He wanted to observe double stars, to catalog them, to find motions of the double stars, maybe yeah, primary in the beginning to, to get rid of uh, parallaxes. No? Because if there are some two double stars very remote from each other in, in the line of sight, uh, you see relative motions due to uh, parallax. And that was not the case, but actually he found uh, indeed a physical motion of the double stars no, uh, orbiting uh, themselves. This came much later, the interpretation of these ideas. So we have three reviews, and here's the period. The first is not well documented. It starts maybe in 1778 and was in Bath, and it took around six months, and we don't know the number of nights. There's no documentation about it. And named stars like like Aldebaran or, or Pollux or Canopus, no, Canopus not, um, uh, Beta Goetze, so uh, these are mentioned here in Bayer stars with the typical alpha, beta, gamma uh, notations. Uh, the magnet li limit was about four mark, and the map and atlas is set of Senex and Harris, and the power was um, um, 222, and the, here another telescope, the seven foot with four inches uh, aperture. Uh, only one double star was 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 actually detected. Um, it was Castor in 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 the Gemini, but it was not uh, his discovery. Another guy had uh, seen Castor as double uh, further uh, than previous to to Herschel. Now we came to second every. That's a, that's a big thing. Uh, it, it's it's uh, long from from August to October, no, 1779 to 1781. Other long thing uh, made at Bath, and uh, 26 months and 20. Um, 225 nights. That's a very, very big thing. No? Uh, every every clear night he was at the telescope. This is the seven foot I show on the upper right. And the Senex Harris charts uh, now are used with a magnitude limit of seven to eight magnitude stars coming from Plumstead. I already mentioned that. And we have the, the upper right telescope. Uh, the first star he found was uh, the pole star. and uh, this was applauded by by all guys at Greenwich and in the uh, Royal Society you know, to find Polaris at uh, as a double star. Uh, Two hundred fifty one new double stars were uh, found in that period. 
Then the third review with the same instrument, but with a slightly higher um, magnification from 20, 227 to 460 now. And we have an um, outcome of 447 uh, uh, additional uh, double stars here. And the range here is from 7081 to 83. And now, Datchet came into a view because he moved to Datchet in early August uh, 1782. And we have 23 months and 20, 271 uh, nights. And we have now Flamsteed stars and they're in vicinity. If you looked at a Flamsteed star, maybe uh, one. 71 Sydney and so and and looked around and and what's what's uh, around there and there are many stars which are not catalogued by Flamsteed which were found to be double and we have a range up to ninth magnitude here and now he had the Atlas Celestis the, the Flamsteed Atlas a big one very very bulky thing and um, again with the same telescope that was the outcome of the first period of observations with his standard seven foot reflector scene uh, at the upper right here. Yes, uh, there were indeed additional observations and discovery in that period, in the first period, uh, up to 1783, all involved uh, or, or done with the seven foot reflector. And Uranus was the, the major thing here. I will not talk about Uranus discovery here. This is a long, long chapter uh, and uh, will to lead us too far from the deep sky theme here. Uh, March 1781. Um, he saw 73 Messier objects with these telescopes here, mainly the seven foot, and, but also uh, saw other non-Messier objects, which does not mean that they are all new. Uh, 12 are new of the 18 nebula and star clusters. Some were non-Messier objects, but not strictly new, uh, seen by other observers uh, prior to him. But eight periodical stars uh, were seen, and six were new, like, uh, yes, uh, uh, these are variable stars. And uh, nine garnet stars, he called very red stars, garnet stars, and eight were new. And the most famous is the Herschel garnet star in Kefir, it's Mu Tsefi. And uh, that was a very, very nice, or is a very, very nice object. So, so and he used the Flamsteed work, the Atlas and the catalog and introduced Flamsteed numbers. They were not in the catalog, neither in the catalog nor in the, the Atlas. And he introduced it just for convenience. He numbered the stars in the catalog and it was uh, Caroline's duty to number these stars in the, in the Atlas. And uh, you see here uh, 45 um, Andromeda, uh, to 39 Andromeda and so on. And also uh, he was uh, called to um, put or to plot in the Messier objects. We see here uh, in the upper right M31 Andromeda Nebula with his companion and M32 and here M33 or, or in Triangulum, the Triangulum Galaxy. And these are the uh, uh, writings and dots made by, by Caroline in the Atlas. Now to Caroline's telescopes. Uh, he started. She started with a, a small refractor, which was bored, and later um, William constructed some uh, two Newtonians for her. The smaller one is the uh, 4.2 inches aperture Newtonian, and with uh, uh, just about two foot, uh, two, two feet uh, focal length. And the four feet came later, some la years later, and it has an, a mirror of 9.6 inches aperture. And what? Did Caroline do with these things here? He observed, she observed and discovered also objects, and I've put out a bit more than the range we are just discussing above. It uh, ranges from 82 to 97. Um, and uh, she, she saw, or these are all documents in, documented in, in her, her observing books, uh, 52 Messier objects, just not, not less than, or much less than, than the, the number, uh, yeah, William had, but in a in smaller period, of course. And um, 16 uh, nebula and clusters, he document, she documented, and 10 were new, so she must be credited for 10 new deep sky objects. Um, and the other were, observed or found 
prior to her by other observers. And of course, eight comets, uh, not all by her primary, but, but co-discovered with, with, uh, for, for some optics with other observers, observers Messier, for instance. So um, yeah, now we turn to the major chapter here on major section uh, about the sweep campaign, which lasted about nearly 20 years from 1783 to 1802. And uh, the observations were made at Datchet, later at Clay Hall or Old Windsor, and uh, then in Slough, at Slough. And the standard instrument, standard reflector, was his Newtonian of 20 feet uh, focal length and 18.7 inches aperture. And it was first installed in, in uh, October 1783. And uh, here is a picture made in 1786 and at that time it was uh, in the front view mode. It started with a Newtonian design and later uh, Herschel developed the front view and you look in two from the platform above into the, the tube from from that position and with a with a small eyepiece fixed at the tube mouth here. Uh, this was at Slough and the standard eyepiece was uh, one with uh, a power of 157 and 15 uh, arc minutes field of view. And also higher powers were used in the sweep campaign uh, for, for more detailed studies of faint objects or so. Uh, 240, 300, 320, and 360. So uh, due to the, the long, long focal length, it was, uh, of course, uh, manageable to, to use higher powers here. Uh, yes, he could also observe in the Senate. It was uh, made by a shift of the tube bottom uh, um, to the center of the stand here. And uh, on the lower right, there's the mechanism not to to uh, shift or on on a yeah on a railway or so that's like that to towards the center and it was managed by by the workman at uh, at the bottom of the telescope i will tell more about that later so he could uh, use uh, the front view and the senate and uh, the platform was shifted as the high at the highest point it was about 6 meters above the ground and in the dark night it was really dangerous no yeah in winter no, for instance, that was, yeah, not, not real, uh, only a, a few accidents happened, no? but uh, it all went well, <laughs> more or less. Now we came to the sweep method. This is the center of, of all things here we'll discuss about sweeping. Um, the tube was fixed in the Marian, primarily in the South Marian, looking south and not movable to the left or right in, in, in the primary uh, uh, situation. And here's the uh, sky at uh, the Windsor area and the pole star is 52 degrees above the horizon. That's the polar distance zero degree and the polar distance is the angle from the pole star to the actual uh, uh, angle of the telescope. Um, the equator is, uh, of course, 19 degrees polar distance, and the opposite, uh, 90 degrees minus, minus delta, is exactly the polar distance, or you can re reverse it to get the declination. And uh, declination is uh, counted from the equator. You see the small delta in my, my. And you see the telescope with its mounting here, and uh, you see the south and north directions. So that's the situation we have in the uh, for the for the sweepings. Now we can scan a rectangular area of the sky over a certain time due to two simultaneous uh, perpendicular motions. The first is uh, an up and down motions of the tube, so you can go up and go down about a certain uh, angle here, uh, maybe about one degree up, one degree down. And these are the fixed PD limits of the sweep. 
but we have another motion with natural motion. This is a sky motion, goes and come from east to west. Uh, if the telescope is fixed in the south, you look into your eyepiece and you see the things moving from one <coughs> limit or edge of the field of view to the other. And there's these typical sky motion motions from east to west. And this is increasing right ascension, of course. You have nothing to do as go up and down and let the sky move from east to west. And that now you have your sweep motion. So, and you get your sweep area. Uh, starting at lower left here and moving up and down and you end uh, about a range R here and you end or you have also a, a range here in PD, which is called D. And you got the sweep area uh, R point D here to calculate the area in, in square degrees or, or whatever you want. So let's go into the details now. Uh, William and Caroline, which was his assistant in all the sweeps, performed 1,112 sweeps. And the PD range, the, the, the breadth of D here is uh, a mean of two degrees. There are some sweeps in the north or more, more to the Senate, which may be to four, up to four degrees. Now, the, the uh, R range uh, is the observing time. Uh, the, the sky moves from east to west, and you follow all these things here in the meridian, and you have a observing time, which is our R here. Uh, and uh, the maximum time uh, of observing was 12.8 hours in, in winter. And that was hard work, really. Often, often several sweeps were made per night uh, in a maximum of 17, shorter ones, of course, and one after another. Then to see things not only in the Senate, but near the pole star, it's impossible. You cannot go beyond the Senate. You, know? you have seen it in this slide just before. Uh, you have to rotate all your stand by 180 degrees around in azimuth, and you go to the north meridian. And then you can go up and down, and you have sweeps in the north. And 167 uh, sweeps were made in the north in, later in, in the period of sweeping. Um, you have to rotate your stand about 180 degrees. And five sweeps were even made in the east. Uh, it was around uh, 1800. Uh, 784. Uh, the, the reason was simple. Um, the telescope was not in a, in a position to see the Andromeda Nebula in the South Meridian. It was too high. And in the early times, the situation was not uh, fixed for the Senate. It's, it goes up maybe to an elevation. Elevation is the angle E here. I forgot to, to mention here. That's the angle from the horizon to the telescope. Uh, position here and not not far than a, about 65 uh, degrees of elevation and that's not enough for the for the for m31 and so so he put he catched it uh, in the east no? it was a bit tricky because in the east uh, the, the the things go uh, with a, with a steep line no? from from low to to up no? up up uh, uh, line which which goes up here, not not a horizontal or vertical line. So it was a bit tricky to get coordinates from that that situation here. Now five suites were made to to see um, the Andromeda Nebula and the surroundings. So three persons were involved in sweeping. First, the observer, this was of course William. Uh, he looked permanently into the eyepiece in the early. Sweepings not. He made some notes at the telescopes. Later, it was shouted to Caroline at her desk, and that was irregular for for most of the sweeps, like regular uh, situation. Um, so he looked permanently into the IPs and and tell told or telling uh, Caroline at her desk what what he have seen. Uh, the recorder Caroline notes his descriptions of the objects and also sidereal time with a clock at her desk and the PD uh, the actual uh, situations of the telescope going up or down and uh, for the moment uh, uh, an object goes centrally to the eyepiece. There was no crosshairs at the eyepiece so it was a bit of tricky of 
experience William had indeed to, to fix the center. And it was transmitted, the value was transmitted by a string to a desk. So he has permanently control of two uh, coordinates. From PT, you get the declination or leave it as a PT. And from the sidereal time, you get the right ascension. So you have uh, already two um, coordinates. And we have a workman at the lower end uh, of the bottom. Um, of the of the tube at the bottom, and he controls the sweep motion, uh, the up and down motion, and uh, of, of course also the the bear motion going to the center for for high declinations. So that's the situation now, and now I have a simulation of the sweep motion. The tube goes up and down. So this is the path of the of the tube, and this is the maybe field of view. And now I start the simulation. William looked into the telescope and goes up and the sky moves from east to west. And he see stuff like this here. And what's really happening is the sweep path starting no, from the beginning at the lower right here. This was the first you know, uh, uh, star we saw when, when starting the simulation to the uh, upper left. And that's the sweep path. No? And we see it's like a crosshair, we see the field of view. There, were, there was no crosshair, but to, to simulate the field of view. And so uh, you have a certain path on the sky, but you leave out some things you know, uh, to the right or left of the path. Now we go the other way, from top to bottom. Yeah, we see already this thing here. We cross the same field here, and we have the other thing around from going from upper right to lower left. That's a sweet pass. So now we have simulated the situation. And what you see here is uh, that you did not cover the, the, the sky. No? Uh, the area uh, completely covered, was the area completely covered by the sweet pass? That's our question here. Uh, of course not, no? because uh, we get a six uh, pattern here, if you combine now the upper and the lower motion here, or the up and down motion, uh, and we get the zigzag. No? And it depends on the sweep pass, how narrow is the, the pattern here. If the sweep speed is low, if you pass the from the bottom to the to the top in, in a long time, maybe some minutes or so, you get these very um, uh, um, the, the, the sweep pattern here to the left. And if you have a moderate speed, a bit higher, uh, you get a narrower, narrower uh, pattern here. And if it's very high, you have the situation here to the right. And that um, say, says that uh, if you have a sweep a speed which is constant, which we ex uh, assume here, and uh, the other thing we, we, we look at the equator with, with declination zero or PD 90 degree, 90 degree uh, then we can uh, calculate the coverage uh, of the sweep area. And the coverage depends only, this is a mathematical uh, uh, thing here behind, um, only on the time t uh, measured in minutes uh, to cross the breadth d. Uh, the breadth d you see here. And the formula is pretty simple. Uh, it's just this formula here. If we apply it to our situation, we have uh, things here. If we cross um, the the breadth in two minutes, we get a coverage of uh, 0 0.44. If it's moderate, maybe one minute, a uh, bit, bit higher speed uh, for sweeping, uh, we have uh, 0 0.75. And in the high position here, half a minute, uh, we have uh, a coverage of one. What does it mean, of course? If we cross it in half a minute, we have a 100% coverage of the sweep area. Now the rectangular thing we see here, no, in the, in the left picture here. And um, the pattern has no gaps. That means that all objects uh, can be seen or are at one time in your, your field of view. If we have a, a, a sweep speed of two minutes or um, time two of two minutes, we have only a 44% coverage, 0 0.44 is, is 44%. Uh, and we have large gaps here. This nebula was never seen. Some objects or maybe many objects are missing now due to the gaps. So it is an illusion to think um, Herschel has covered all sweep areas. 
maybe he, he has because he had, he had the right higher speed here, no? but actually he, he did not. William uh, was aware of the gap of the gap problem. He knew about it, uh, and it determines the effectiveness of sweeping. No? How how many objects are lost, and how many objects can can be seen in theory. We tackle this issue in, in three steps. First step, uh, in three questions, actually. Uh, what was the total sky area of all sweeps when assuming a 100% coverage? So we assume here this situation here to the right. No? Uh, sweep was high enough, a sweep sweep was high enough to get the 100% coverage. And what is the total area of all sweeps uh, when we look into the, to the documents and What's the result? And then second, we ask, what was the coverage of an individual sweeps? What, what was e really realized? Not, not 100%, it's absurd. Maybe this or this here. No? What was the individual sweep uh, coverage? So we have to look at all 1,112 sweeps, of course. And third, was the sweep speed really constant? Now, this pattern uh, is, is due to constant sweep speed and uh, causing these regular zigzag pattern here. So first, the total sweep sky, uh, total sky area can be determined by current sweep records. It's a big thing in eight volumes and all 1,112 sweeps are recorded. And there are also not one version of the records, there are four versions and this is a is a big thing of, of data. Right? And no one, maybe Dreyer in, in 1888 or later for his, his papers uh, uh, or his scientific papers, he wrote some, some things about that, but not in detail. So there was, there's no one in the world ever looked as deep or deep enough into the records to, to get rid of these questions here I ask. Yeah, contain a large amount of data. And the, the eight volumes are all the small portion, uh, portion of all these records I've uh, looked into and, and digitized and made my tools and so on and so on. Uh, and there you can see the PD and RR limits of each sweep. And now a picture for the first time will be seen of the actual sky coverage of the sweeping areas which are now we see here just in a moment in a gray above yeah no, no okay not yet well, just a moment uh, William observed down to a pd of 123 degrees that is uh, minus 33 degrees declination he found objects the unknown objects galaxies nebula which st stood only seven degrees above the horizon that implies that he has a very, very good sky there, no? yeah? And a good uh, horizon, of course, too. Now, the picture. Yes, all the gray uh, rectangles are the sweep areas, 1,112. Then you have the red dots here. These are all objects he discovered, all individual objects. Sometimes it was there are double entries for the same thing, and uh, we have two thousand four hundred and forty-seven uh, nebula and star clusters discovered by him. The black dots are the stars he observed in his sweeps, seen and documented in his field of view, and these are three thousand six hundred thirty-eight stars, and one thousand sixty-three were used as reference stars. So reference stars in these stars are these stars with a very exact um, documentation of the position and they were known to be in Flamsett catalog and from there uh, he, he uh, got the, the correct uh, uh, coordinates, right ascension and declination and that was the major point to uh, fix the relative positions of all other objects observed in the sweep and from that you can uh, determine actual position, uh, absolute positions for each object. So that's the situation here. You see, indeed, yeah, uh, Vega was in a sweep, no? but not um, 
but not Polaris. The only two sweeps were just seen as north, a bit uh, stretch here because of the pro projection here. No? Uh, there are areas in the north not swept uh, completely and here uh, in that region also, and in that region north of, of Lyra, um, um, many gaps here. So now you can calculate the um, area covered here by the gray rectangles and you get a coverage of 90% of the observable sky down to his, his southern limit and uh, starting at the north. 90% of the observable sky was uh, uh, covered by the, or nominally covered by the sweep areas. And by a geometric analysis you can do, uh, I will not go into the details here, the total overlap between these sweep areas, which is actually uh, uh, a number you can determine from this analysis, is uh, about 36%. Just he has seen many things twice or even three times or up to nine times um, and this is due to the overlap. This was necessary because uh, some sweeps are not well taken on T decide or she, Caroline and William decided uh, to, to sweep some portions of the area again, north, south or east or west of it. Now we get uh, we come to the second point. It, it is hard to determine the coverage for individual sweeps. You have all the records and you can just find out what was the real path of uh, his observations. This is very, very difficult. It's impossible. But by a statistical trick, you can estimate the total gap area. Uh, that's uh, the thing I will explain now here. With the 18.7 inch, um, the standard reflector, William observed non-stellar objects down to the 15th magnitude. I will later on show the, the uh, lowest case here, in, or the object with the lowest uh, magnitude. And the mean is 12.0 uh, magnitude. So here's the brightness distribution of all findings, uh, non-stellar objects found by Herschel. So we see here around 12 magnitude, see the, the mean position here. Yeah, there are some very bright ones, uh, new ones, and uh, a few very faint ones. So now taking all visually found NGC IC objects, which is the standard source we, you can use because most of these objects were found by visible observations. Uh, and you're setting in the limit of, of 13.5 magnitude conservative limit. We get uh, 3,523 observable objects, observable for Herschel in his telescope, uh, in the area covered by all sweeps, the gray areas here. And now Herschel saw 2,447 of them. Hmm, that's, that's a lot. The sweep analysis shows that only a few observable objects which were on the sweep bus, which were actually in this field of view, no, were missed on the pass. I have studied all these views and tried to find out what was seen and what was seen not. Uh, you can also check these stars, which were observable in the sweep. So not for all sweeps, but, but for uh, a certain sample, which is uh, informative enough. Uh, this implies a very high success rate. You have all these things seen. Yeah. Uh, no doubt, it's not, of only a few ding things on the past were re really missed. He was so good in his eyes. Fantastic. The greatest observer of all times. That's the number of 1,076 unseen objects is mainly due to the gaps. And now you can calculate the ratio. Now you can estimate the sweep coverage C by the ratio of 2,447 to the all others, this is 0 0.7. So 70% of the total sweep area was really seen. And you have a great coverage. You, you remember what, what this implies for the sweep speed is two minutes is a bit too long, but maybe around one minute or so you get a 70% sweep coverage. So you can estimate now also the, the uh, sweep speed, of course. All these things can you uh, you can be derived from, from the data, but you need the right tools for that and the digital data. It's, it's not a matter of estimation and look into the records and make your conclusions. That's it's not possible. 
So we get the conclusion that uh, William viewed 63% in his sweep passes over all these areas he's seen uh, of the visible sky. This is simply due to 0 0.9, the 90%, um, and multiplied by 0 0.7, the 70%, and you get 0 0.63. So he saw 63 of the visible percent of the visible sky from the winter area. Uh, this is enormous. But not 100%, no? This is due to the sweep motion. Now, third point. Sweep analysis shows a regular pattern generally does not fit to the observe, observed objects. And this is because Herschel's sweep was not a zigzag pass. If you see, if you look in detail or analysis of the sweep motion and the objects found or not found, you can um, simulate the sweep pass for for the sweeps you can uh, choose for your for your determination here. And I took a, a sweep number three hundred ninety six. It was made at Datchet uh, on eleventh April seventy eighty five. It uh, was around twenty nine degrees declination, and the breadth was two point three degree, and the uh, our range was uh, three hours and sixty. Uh, 36 minutes. That was the observing time of the sweep, a long sweep, of course. And it was the most effective. We will see just now. Uh, this was um, the best version of the uh, records uh, of Caroline for this sweep here, the latest one. And you see all the data here. I will not go into the details here. No? Uh, this is the uh, right ascension or the sidereal clock reading. This is the uh, PD string reading and these are the uh, corrections and all the things uh, from that was shouted out by, by William in the description of the objects here, suspect the object. Here's certainly bright, pretty large, much brighter middle objects and the greatest brightness uh, and uh, long um, elongated. It's uh, near to certain Leonis. This was a reference star. Another reference star is see here. Okay. Okay, um, it stretches over Leon Midar, Usa Major, uh, uh, Coma Bernicus, and Carnes Vinazzi, and uh, ending near the globular cluster M3. So, this is the coverage here, or the sweep area, not the real coverage. You, you assume now the six are cores here, and uh, you got all the uh, objects found in that night. And this is a record number. It's uh, the most successful sweep ever made. Uh, 69 objects, new objects were found in that uh, night. All are galaxies, uh, about 20, 10 to 15 since magnitude. Uh, 20 C belong to the, 25 belong to the uh, Virgo cluster. Here we see part of the Virgo cluster here, Coma Berenicus, here's Leo, here's Arctur and below is Virgo. And uh, 11 are in the Coma cluster, a small, Apple cluster, uh, 1656, uh, and uh, he saw 11 objects in that coma cluster. Uh, now, you can estimate or you can think about if the sweep pattern is really the path of the object sequence. Yeah, you go from one object to another and uh, um, connect the, the uh, positions by a red line, and you see this one here. No? Uh, this is absurd. No, because William must have known where the new objects are located. This is impossible. No? But this also shows that it's not, not uh, possible to get a, um, a regular path with this pattern behind of observed or found objects here. It's impossible to, to um, get or to, to construct a, a sweep pattern, which is regular in zigzag mode now to cover these things here. I will show it in two, two um, uh, pictures here. Uh, William's sweep pattern based on sweep analysis is just this one here. Starting here, it was first pretty regular. Then he found a star here in, in this, um, this field of view here, this was missed. The star was just in the gap. And also in the back motion here, it was not in the field of view. So this star is missed. Uh, this star is also missed. The first objects here. This was his first galaxy. This was his first star here. And the star, the galaxy was seen at the western edge of the field of view. So now he followed this object. You see it, that's the, the blue uh, field of view 
starting with the green one. So he just took a while to describe the objects. Now we have a horizontal motion here. Then he goes down to this bottom um, of the sweep area and going up again, missing this one here, but seeing this star here and going up and down in regular passes. And now this was also not, not, not uh, seen. It was missing here, going down. And now things are developing here and he, this was seen, this was recorded, it took some time, the motion stopped no, to record it, then goes up here and we are down here, now stop again for this one, stop again, goes up. Why he did not go to the bottom and going up again or here, uh, don't know. And, that, and then the continuation here, uh, motion often stopped or was even reversed, we see it. And now the continuation, this one is the same like this here, and it was followed for a certain time, now up, down, regular, but now stop again for this uh, reference star here. And here it's, it's, it's crowded. Now, now he stopped it, not going up, this was missed here, going more to the, to the right here, this was left here, and then stop again, and now it was was crazy here. No? Now you get these patterns here. And this all implies that the situation that develops his path. And it seems to me is very crazy that he often anticipated new objects and he wrote about it, instinct, about his instinct of when it is likely to find nebula, as is fantastic. Yeah. So <laughs> going more or less up and down, many things were really missed, but he, he was aware that, or thing, he looked at this thing and ah, I have to go a bit more in that direction or that direction to find more, why ever. He sensed a high object density, especially in the Virgo cluster. So he found many objects which were missed when, when the sweepers were regular. So that's the situation. Uh, for the detail optics study, stop, he had a side motion and he couldn't go up to four field of view to the west following that object. Now we have a stop and, and the time was needed to describe a, a certain situation in the field of view. Then the motions went back to the beginning and it was stopped by a bar here. So he never could go more to the east, uh, only to the west to follow the motion. But this was a limit here because otherwise the situation of the, the telescope would be changed and uh, that's not possible to get uh, coordinates in a changed situation. This was uh, strictly forbidden. And William had a hand wheel at the eyepiece to control this motion here. So otherwise it was impossible to, to get maybe a double or, or triple galaxy you know, to describe all the things here. You know, when, when the things goes moving or going up or, or down now, you know, it was too, uh, too short at the time to, to get it. So it was stopped. Uh, the types of new objects, we have uh, two described objects, galaxies, emission nebula, planetary nebula, open clusters, global clusters, and other cases which are not true deep sky objects. Uh, parts of galaxies, maybe a, a H2 region of a bright galaxy, or a star, a single pair or group of stars, or even not found objects or non-existent objects, don't know. Now here's the distribution. 86% of all uh, deep sky objects were galaxies. Then a few emission nebula, another small peak here for open clusters. And these are the uh, non-real uh, or non-true um, uh, deep sky objects here, galaxies, parts or stars or so. So I will show some uh, triple um, or trios of stars here, which are appear in the NGC. <laughs> Dry was not... Um, uh, he had no vision of these things. He, he wrote what, what Herschel said, but never controlled it at the, in the sky with his telescopes. And so he, he noted down these things and included in his NGC catalog. Uh, about one, one um, arc minute uh, wide here. Two. Now we have two uncatalogued patches. Nice, nice as asterisms here. Uh, size about 2.5 uh, arc minutes. Uh, these were not cataloged and uh, does, do not appear in the NGC, of course. Uh, special deep sky objects, I, I will mention here, the first 
a digit already uh, was this one ngc2232 an open cluster in monotus um, 4.2 magnitude the last one was in 1802 here a uh, galaxy in, in in the great bear here pretty bright one the brightest was an open cluster in in uh, kindness major uh, this one here and maybe known for some with a very bright uh, star in the center tau uh, Canis Majoris in 783. And the faintest we will see here is this galaxy here, near the star here. It's uh, NGC 2843, a galaxy in sensor with 15.5 magnitude. Uh, extreme, extreme observation, extreme. Yeah. The most known sun was in Ursa Minor, of course, uh, 1802, and the most southern in. Uh, Foranex, this is one of these objects only seven degrees above the horizon. Uh, incredible observation. The smallest uh, was in the Panther Nebula in, in Sagittarius, uh, 16 uh, arc minutes, uh, arc seconds wide, and uh, is <laughs> maybe with uh, higher observation, uh, high magnitudes, 360 um, uh, mag uh, power to, to see these small things, to, to detect these small things. It's It's incredible. So now uh, a, sh a collection of Herschel's sketches. He sketched things here, pretty good, of course. And may you are made to illustrate his classification system based on the textual descriptions. And it was made by managed by Caroline. Uh, the typical eight classes here from one to eight and the numbers involved in that things here. Mm, and uh, now a small collection of 80 sketches, uh, which can be seen in this documents here. Uh, let's start with Messier objects and Edron galaxies here. This is M98. Uh, here's a rough sketch here, and here's a sketch of the finder situation here. The finder had a field of view of two degrees uh, with crosshairs, of course. This was the sketch, and this was a rendered uh, thing for the publication later, figure one. Uh, this is M98, edge on, or nearly edge on galaxy. Now, uh, some other cases left his drawing or sketch, and this is the, the actual uh, image here. Uh, or globular cluster M53 in, in Coma Berenicus. The typical galaxy with the black uh, band here, the, the absorption lane here, NGC 891 in Andromeda, another very small or very flat galaxy here on two others. Uh, he saw the easy shape here, no? which is a bit uh, like uh, not, not really edge on. So now uh, some irregular galaxies, emission nebulas and galaxy pairs here. This is the amorphous galaxy in Canis Benazzi 4449. You saw four uh, H2 regions in the uh, inner uh, region of, of the galaxy. Uh, in this case, the emission nebula was seen in three parts. Maybe this is one part, this is the other one, and maybe here the third one. This is uh, the eastern part of the Veil Nebula in Cygnus, uh, NGC. Western part is also was also discovered in the same night, coming first. Now two double galaxies, here one in Leo, and here another pair a bit wider, and here are these, these sketches here. And finally, we have some cometer objects. This is an interesting thing, some planetary nebula here. And this is was seen cometary here, like a nucleus and, and tail here. Actually, it is a uh, galaxy with um, a strange nucleus here to the side. This is due to interaction of galaxies, of course. Uh, so not central nucleus. Here we see in the planetary nebula, um, NGC 1514, which he saw with the star in the center. And th this was the main point to to, to uh, create the idea that uh, nebula are formed from stars. Now, so by condensing matter, which now, well, it's, it's, it's a good idea, it's perfect. Now here again, uh, cometary objects, which uh, is now a combination of uh, a galaxy and a star. This is the star, so nothing is here of, of real cometary appearance. This is a real cometary nebula. This is Hubble's um, variable nebula uh, in Monoceros, and this is NGC 2261, and he, uh, she, uh, Herschel saw this, this small patch here with the nucleus, and, which is actually the stars emitting here, or uh, in, in, in lighting here, his uh, 
cometary regions. And this is again a star with a, with a planetary nebula in this case, uh, which he saw as a comet. So now we came to the annual sweeping hours and uh, the total observing time was, uh, were all the sweeps here is 15 of five hours. Uh, starting in uh, 7083, yeah, in October, it was not much to do in that year, but 7084 was the, the major year of all. Then things go down, maybe due to family things, marriage and so on, new telescopes and so on. And it uh, goes here down to 1802. So this is the actual uh, uh, sweeping hour curve here. Oh, we have a daily uh, picture here of the record year, 7084. And here you see the daily uh, observing hours, the white uh, points here up to 10 hours here in this point here in, in December. And I have in the background the moon phase. This is full moon, this is new moon, full moon, new moon. So you see that most, of course, around new moon, uh, things were observed, but also much near to 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 full moon or for the, the two quarters. Uh, so he tried every single moment where you no, know, maybe some clouds are there, but it was okay, and the moon was also not too bright. And he observed, and and Caroline at his side. So I have all these diagrams for all all these uh, uh, years here. Uh, William published three catalogues of new nebula and star clusters uh, in the Philosophical Transactions for 1783, 89, and 1802, uh, 70, and so on. And 1000 plus 1000 plus 500, and we have 2500 entries. This does not mean there's, that we have 2500 objects because there are double entries and some are missing or not real or not true deep sky objects. I've mentioned already the cases. Um, then in the documents, I could found 76 uncatalogued objects, which are real deep sky objects, galaxies in most. 27 are not in the NGC. 22 were galaxies in different catalogs of, of uh, non-stellar objects. These are two galaxy catalogs. And we see here uh, small collections. These three here, these in M MGC uh, galaxies, this is an UGC galaxy. No? So, it goes through all catalogs you can imagine. Four open clusters are among the sample here and one emission nebula. And now about the accuracy of Williams position determined by reference stars, I should mention it, and uh, seen in the sweeps. Now here is the number or frequency of uh, the position difference just in uh, arc minutes between William and the real sky. And this is for uh, RR and PD. And you see, when you see the, the large amount here and going down here, you can determine the mean error of his uh, positions. And when you uh, calculate the mean error from this uh, diagram, you get an uh, in right ascension error of 3.5 uh, arc minutes and in PD a, a bit less. And this is enormous. This is with this rough instrument, no? yeah, you, you get these uh, things and you can all things, uh, you can all locate these things by these, um, by these uh, accuracy. No? Only a few galaxies or a few objects are not found or did not exist, but most of them are, are fixed by these uh, uh, small limits here. It is fantastic. Now a small uh, excursion on scar gauges. Uh, in in the uh, field of view, he when there was time and not too many uh, new objects here, uh, he counted the stars in the field of view of 15 arc minutes diameter. And a gauge is a mean maybe of maximum two fields and the number of stars in these 10 fields divided by 10. And he counted 1,000 91 gauges while while sweeping while sweeping and seeing stars and nebula and all things about that sometimes a meteor crossed or bright star whatever all was documented no and this is documented too these ga gauges better but he says gauges uh, these are all the gauges here down to the limit of minus 30 degree and up to the north pole here and then you see the crowdings here this is the band of the milky way this is the North Galactic Pole, and this is the um, center of the Milky Way in Sagittarius and the anti-center here in Auriga. 
And from that, he selected uh, 127 uh, gauges in this great circle of the sky going through the North Galactic Center and this section of the stellar system. And um, he calculated the distance in each view uh, to get the most distant object in this view. And that was a distance, uh, a pretty rough estimate, uh, of course, yes. But, but you can define the edge of the system in these great circle here. And that's the um, thing you may have seen in the literature. This is not the Milky Way. This is only a section uh, along these paths here, or great circle. And there's the sun here, and in that direction you see such wide, and here in the other, um, special, and here it's not so deep, or views not, was not so deep in that case this year. And if you see the real situation here, now again a new very new uh, demonstration you have a, 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 a yeah a section of the real milky way and here are the the um, uh, the constellations in that uh, round going circle here now and you see the the thing i've seen in plain or you've seen in plain view here now inside the milky way he did not estimate the real size it is maybe a factor of five or six or so now it's uh, not so wide but it, it's it's a bit overestimated here it's going to the to the real edge it's not the case but to see the the uh, arrangement of the size or uh, arrangement of the section uh, so a few large reflectors made yet later um, this is uh, <laughs> i took some <laughs> images from or paintings from the literature, which are ridiculous. <laughs> 40 foot telescope with 48 inches, 1787. And this is not in Datchet. This is a house we see in the first um, uh, image, starting image of my slides here. And that's a Datchet house, but never stood in Datchet. It was uh, erected uh, later. Uh, Another very ridiculous view is this here. <laughs> this, the, the tube uh, is directly to the bottom, no? and uh, in uh, yeah, front view situations to look at the bottom. No, both are in the literature. Uh, this is a Spanish telescope of uh, 25 uh, foot uh, focal lengths, a feet focal lengths, and 24 inches in diameter. And the latest one is this year, the X-foot, ten, large 10-foot uh, telescope, which is shut, such compact like a modern Dobson telescope. And he used it uh, for, for Monsieur objects in these later years. And this is a planned one. Uh, it was, yeah, developed in 1781 already, and 30-foot, 63 inches, never realized. But with the typical pole mountain here, we, we saw from, from the 12 foot telescope. Never realized. Uh, the mirror broke uh, two pieces in, in several pieces, and the second one, uh, two. So, uh, yes, the only one uh, used for, for sweeps is, is this one. Only a few sweeps were, were uh, made with its uh, cumbersome telescope here, and he found. 12 objects, or saw 12 objects in his uh, descriptions here in his documents, and three are actually new. Uh, two objects were seen with this one, 39 non stellar objects were seen with this one, or uh, non Messier objects. No, I must correct, Messier object included. Now, the annual observations in days for the whole period from 1774 until 1890, it goes a bit further. Let's see because uh, Caroline's things can going here beyond this state. Uh, yes, this is the fir first area of, um, yeah, covering here the, the double observations in the reverse and the Messier observations in the early times. These are the sweeps, the green ones, nebula and clusters, and double stars, even the sweeps were 145 new double stars found later. And uh, again, now after the sweeping period here, we go back to the uh, solar system, uh, to double stars and Messier objects, and also solar system objects or single stars. And these are mixed observations, just, um, yeah, made for the review, for the star review, or for review later found, uh, later 
developed and sweep and also uh, yeah the sweep was terminated and the rest of the night was maybe used for solar system ob objects for saturn jupiter many many observations of these great planets so now we have caroline uh, going to 1935 his last observations was one of Halley's comet in made in hanover already and he also she also um made uh, observations by her own, the black ones, but also with uh, the aid of uh, William or William at her side. And these are documented here. Nebula, clusters, Messier objects, new comets, the eight comets are located here, and known comets later were, were favored targets here in the later years. So Caroline uh, has uh, published, well, not published, but made two, two major contributions to the literature. And the one is, is her uh, revision of the British catalog from 1798, which was published by the Royal Society here. And with a foreword from William, of course, and it covers all the uh, Flamsted stars and the corrections to the Flamsted stars due to William and uh, his observations. Uh, but this is even more important is, is her stone catalog of 1825, which was unpublished. And no one has really looked in that stone catalog except uh, John, because it was made for John to um, make his uh, observations at Slough in the first period and later uh, in the southern sky, but only a small overlap to the northern sky, of course. But uh, this was made for John, and uh, the big, big work started around 18, yeah, 19, 17, 19, about that, and finished in later in Hanover in 1825. And it lists 4,025 observations of 2,491 nebula and star clusters seen by, by documented. Uh, seen by William and documented by her. And the objects are identified by Caroline's general number. He, she created a general number like the NGC number, NGC 1234 or so. Uh, and it goes from one to 2,500, of course, because this is the limit of the third catalog. And she calculated new positions for the equinox of 1800 and based on 1,133 reference stars, a huge work. And all the data are arranged in PD zones. And this is the first uh, uh, page of her catalog. This is a uh, writing of John, Carolina Lucrezia Herzl. And this is the most north on PD zone from, from zero to nine degrees north polar distance. And the objects here are, are uh, identified by, her gen by the general number. And this is the typical class number, second class of a faint nebula with number 700. Uh, four and so on. Here, first class nebula. This is the la last uh, PD zone here, 100 to uh, 20, 21 degrees south. And for this work here, for the zone catalog, she received the Ares Gold Medal. She was not a member because it was not allowed for, for women to be a member of the Royal Astronomical Society, but she, she got it in 1828. Uh, John Herschel was president at the time, but uh, she was not the one, he was not the one to to uh, to speak the Laudesio. Laudesio was uh, South James South, uh, second president or vice president. Finally, some curious observations. This brings us to the end. Yes, in 776, William saw a, a forest on the moon. This is his drawing. Yeah, with trees in near the crater of Cassandi, Maru Morum, at the edge of, of the moon. Um, yeah, curious, there are no trees on the moon. Yeah. But this is not <laughs> the way to, to make uh, historical uh, research. You cannot criticize uh, further, a, a former, former persons because of some things you, you know now much better. But it is curious, uh, uh, of course. Now, uh, 1782, Williams found a comet. Uh, he, he never found a comet, so it was not a real comet, of course, in, in serpents. And Caroline solved the case a month, uh, month later 
Finder with use of uh, or the aid of Messier's catalog. And it uh, turned out to be the Globe Lacoste M5 in Serpents. This was the sketch Herschel made. And Herschel waited from day to day for a motion and he was not aware of, of the motion or could not fix it or see it. And so Caroline was pretty critical about this thing and looked into the Messier catalog, which Herschel at that time never had, had done. It was in his library, but not used at that time. Uh, in some years, three years later, a nebula was found around Epsilon Orionis, the brightest star or a bright star in the, in the belt of these three Orion stars here, center of Orion. And uh, yes, of course, Dreyer cataloged it. Uh, criticized and Herschel wrote epsilon passed and I am pretty sure it is involved in nebulosity unequally diffused a mere illusion and a mere illusion yes another thing here uh, in 1787 uh, Herschel discovered this uh, nice galaxy and it was a major, uh, it is uh, NGC 3930. And he used a reverend star here, or he detected or in, his, in his field of view, the reverend star was here and uh, of six magnitude. And I see it in his documents and I looked and looked and looked and did not find any star in that position of six magnitude. It was impossible until I find out that Herschel has seen the star with the third largest proper motion. And now the star is here. And this is Groombridge, 1830. It's now 25 five hour, it's, uh, southeast of the galaxy. Yes, I was wondering what, what, what's about this star. It's impossible that, that the bright star could not be identified. It was not a fault of, of, of Herschel or Caroline, of William or Caroline, um, no. Uh, it was not on 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 the in the catalogs, but uh, oh, some stars are not in the catalogs, and no problem. But actually, <laughs> this is a, a high speed star here. Uh, yes, Groombridge, the English amateur, has, has cataloged it. Uh, now, uh, same year, Wichler thought uh, William thought to have detected a ring around Uranus. He made four uh, sketches here ring around Uranus. It was, yeah, a strange guy who, who thinks he, Herschel might have seen the real Uranus ring, which is there, of course, but much too faint, this is ridiculous. Now, what, what Herschel really has seen or detected is, uh, this wasn't, of course, an illusion, but he discovered actually the flattening of the planet. It's not, it's an oval, no? oval body. No? The pole distance is smaller than the equator distance or diameter. So, yes, that's it. Summary, monumental work of the Herschels. In yellow, I have uh, highlighted the uh, things we have mentioned in the talk here, starting with observations and discoveries. We have uh, uh, mentioned nebular star clusters. Yes, Herschel has made a definition of globular clusters, of planetary nebula, of dark nebula, indeed, of stars. Single stars are not so relevant, but double stars we have uh, treated in the first chapter. Star counts, red stars, yes, variable stars, but not in detail. Uh, star counts, these are gauges here. The solar system, Uranus, yes, four moons, two of Uranus, two of Saturn, we are detected by Herschel. The rotation of the planets, the flattening of Uranus. Then the orbital motion of double stars no, was detected by him. Thermal radiation, uh, heat radiation, yes. Then telescopes and instruments, front view I've mentioned, micrometer development. Uh, then massive stellar statistics, these are star gauges uh, are uh, the beginning of stellar statistics now to get rid of the, or the estimation of the distance of the form or shape of the Milky Way and, and such things here from statistical uh, measurements here, counting stars. Magnitude scale, yes, a big thing he made in his later years to, to find a, a correct or um, reliable magnitude scale. Distant estimate in connection with the star counts. 
then theory, the theory of the Milky Way, the stellar system was developed by him in his many, many publications in the later years from 1811 to 1818 for big publications. Uh, Evolution and nature of nebulas and clusters is included in this uh, series. And then the solar space motion, yes. In the beginning, he found out the sun is moving towards the star Lambda in, in Hercules, which is correct. Then publications, yes, catalog. We mentioned the three catalogs, double star catalogs, three of them. Um, nebula and star clusters inside, papers and so on, many, many papers. Then uh, finally, Caroline observing systems, of course, preparation of all the sweeps. In the daytime, he was, uh, she was uh, dealing with the problem, what, what uh, will be seen next night and which sky area should be uh, uh, covered or observed. Then the recording while sweeping was her uh, thing to deal with. And then evaluation in, in the next day, uh, documentation, all things were written down a second, a third, a fourth time and so on. Calculations of all these star positions, uh, cataloging uh, at late phases of the campaign here. Yeah, the publication of Told about um, very low error rate. There's only a few errors inside. Uh, yeah, according to the or, or relating to the many many uh, numbers and, and data amounts we have here, it's it's very very low. There are some, but it's very low rate. Then it's her own observation and discovery of nebula and clusters, eight comets. Yes, and publications. Uh, yeah not really, really published. It was not known by the astronomical community uh, what is inside the zone catalog. I have, yes, looked into this catalog and found out all the things I've told about and many more. And um, then the revision of the British catalog. Yes, and finally, these things are inside in my big thing about the new general catalog. Herschel is um, also uh, subject of this book here uh, from uh, 20, uh, 2008, 2010, it was published by Cambridge University Press. A big thing, and an even bigger one is now in preparation. It's the same picture I've seen. This is a Dutch house again, and uh, with the same uh, heading we have for this talk here. Yes, and now. Thank you for attention and asking for any questions. Thank you. Wow, well, thank, thank you so much, Wolfgang. Yeah, that, that was an absolutely amazing talk. Uh, I mean, for, for, for me, that, that was a unique explanation. I've never seen it like that before of his observational techniques, his sweeping techniques. Really beautiful explanation that, that I, I completely understand now. Um, how he did that. And, and I think for me, what came across as well was the immense dedication that he showed. And, and of course, with dedication comes, as you ex explained, great discovery. And, 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 and of course, it was nice as well, the way you wove in, you know, the, the, the support, the collaboration really he had from his sister Caroline. So yeah, wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. Um, yes, thank, thank so, you. Um, uh, the, the chat is open for questions because there are so many of us. We thought we, we, we shouldn't really uh, allow voice questions. It might get a bit chaotic. So please, if you have any questions, um, type them in the chat. Um, I mean, I, I, I have one, um, Wolfgang. Yes. I mean, you know, all, all these observations, re really, um, uh, William had the finest telescopes of his time, didn't he? That, that he, yes, he, yes. He, 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 he formulated his own specular metal he ground his own mirrors, built his own telescopes. I, I, I've always wondered, did he ever share these techniques, this knowledge, or, or did he keep it for himself? I mean, I know this wasn't the time of sort of modern science and explaining your methods, you know, in papers and so on, but or, or would he have kept all this secret, you know, how he, how he made his mirrors, you know, what formulation he used for the metal? Uh, no, no, it's, there's no secret. Um, all is published in his uh, many, many things he, he, wrote for for the uh, 
Philosophical Transactions or okay. also in other magazine in, at Bath in the first time. And you can read all things no? about the 40 feet or so, 40 foot telescope or, or the other telescope of, of mirror making and, and so on. All is documented. Mm. No? And uh, what is not published, you can, you can um, uh, read uh, in his uh, manuscripts no? and in these thousands of pages <laughs> you you can you can experience that no? and and uh, it's all there it's all there mm. okay not not uh, f mostly not for the public uh, in, in in detail but these rough things are are for the public the details are in these many many uh yeah notebooks or or observation books or whatever you have now and all written down by caroline mostly mm. Well, well, I mean, we, we've had a first question from, from Primula, which I suppose in a way was linked to my question. She says, thank you for the talk, by the way. Mm -hmm. But what, what do you feel put the Herschels in a different scale to, to, to others of, of the time? Was it, was it the telescope quality, like I mentioned? The recording of the details, the time he spent sweeping. What do you think was most it, critical? It, it, it was it was all. There's no competition. The only competition at that time maybe come from from Messier, and Messier was a comet hunter, so a small cutlet of 103 uh, objects. Uh, and there was, in the beginning, there was a big uh, competition, uh, but shortly, uh, <laughs> Herschel topped the 103 no, number. No, there was, there was none competition, uh, no, in, in every aspect. No. Mm. Telescope making later, later Lord Ross no, did some things no, which were, were bigger no, or constructed some telescopes which were bigger, but uh, it took a, a lot of time, you know, half a century. Mm. So in every aspect, Herschel was a, a, a phenomenon. No? Yeah. Mm. Yes. There, there is one uh, or a few other questions in the actual uh, chat box. One of them is um, the gap in the sweep coverage around Lyra is very striking. Was William aware of this and did he try to fill the gap? Yeah, yeah he was aware of all the gaps. Now, and uh, in his later years, he tried to uh, cover more of the northern pole uh, area there. Now, but he was or he and 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 his sister no, were were exhausted. No, uh, you you see the the uh, number of nights no, going down uh, towards the end. No, there was not much time for for filling the gaps and and no no power no, of of the two. No, yeah, uh, and there was simply calling uh, enough observed no? and it was okay no and um, the last catalog has o only yeah in parentheses uh, only 500 objects not thousand again no? so we have not thousand thousand and thousand or we have 2500 no? and it was speculated about yeah going what are looking at the at the gaps for another 500 no? to 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 get to the same number no? it was not realized it was they were too exhausted Mm. And uh, he, of course, he, William was too old at that time to to make a daily, a da a, like in these early days, a daily uh, observing, uh, 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 yeah, daily observing in, in the same frequency as in the in the beginning. So it wasn't possible. It was too much. So we have, I think, a related question from. George Mollenbrock, who says hi from New Mexico in the USA. Okay. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hello, George. Um, and George asks, in the sweep coverage map, why are the gaps not random in right ascension? They, they seem to be most common near Vega. Is this a seasonal effect, e.g. poorer observing conditions? Uh, just pick out the... I think this is the image uh, in question here, isn't it? Yeah. I think so. Yes. Uh, yeah. What exactly was the question? Uh, so, so, bit... so, in that coverage, why are the gaps not random in right ascension? They seem to be most common near the right ascension of Vega. Uh, this is the this is the okay. position here. Mm. So, so, why are the gaps concentrated in that area? Ah, uh -huh. okay, okay, okay. It's yeah. it's uh, yeah, okay. It's near the Milky Way. Um, hmm. 
it's difficult to say. Maybe it, it, it depends on the season, yeah, and and maybe uh, it was not the right season to to fill the gaps here, no? and he worked more more in the south or fills want to fill gaps in the north. It it depends on the on the monthly or daily situation, no? yeah. Maybe there are often uh, clouds for for maybe three weeks or so, mm -hmm. no? and and that may cause all these gaps and. Yeah, and uh, from from the schedule, no? other other places were better to reach for for the for the siblings at that time, no? and so these are remaining so more or less. No? Yeah, uh, the detailed answer I cannot give the detailed answer, but it it mainly because of the bad weather. There was bad weather. No? I've calculated that maybe the, the yeah, look for half of all the the time in 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 a year. No? Every single moment with with gaps in the clouds or so to see the real sky there, and it was it was made. No? But later on, it was not made. No? They were not willing to to look at that or that point. No? And yeah, they had seen enough. I think that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's another talk in the chat, uh, uh, sorry, another question in the chat box, which refers to the mechanism which allowed the 20 foot telescope to be directed towards the zenith. Did, mm -hmm. the, four, did the 40 foot use the same technique? Okay, I just pick out the, the image in question. I think this one here, no? Uh, no, um, the maximum elevation of the 40 foot, takes this for the 40 foot, for instance, uh, was about, 60 degrees, not farther north, because it was unstable at higher uh, uh, elevations. No, it was too big. No, simply too big. No. Yeah, just too bulky. And then the mirror may be more and more deforming from from a mean situation. No? Yeah, it's all all what we do now no, to to uh, get rid of these uh, ideal shapes of mirrors. No? Yeah, and that was a heavy mirror and a pretty thin one. No? So it depends on a, on a, on a certain range of optimal optimum. Uh, uh, focus, no, which could get uh, or develop or get reached with with this situation, that was instrument. No? So it was very sensitive no, to uh, to all kinds of of influences, mechanical, optical, and so it was not a good telescope at all. Mm. Yeah, it was never. So, sorry, Joe, go on. I was going to say, and le leading on talking about his telescopes, um, Anne and uh, Ken Holmes, who are joining us uh, this evening from Elgin in Scotland, um, want to know that obviously uh, Herschel made all of his own scopes, but where did he get the materials for them? Mm -hmm. um, yes, the, the, uh, for, for the mirrors, the copper and tin uh, was available everywhere and, and, and mixed together and heated and, and, and was mold, uh, yeah, put in the oven or so. And, and it, it was all, all things he did with his co-workers or assistants or uh, people he, he employed for this for this business there. No? And the construction, the wood construction was made by his workers there. He, he uh, mainly overviewed these things there and or made the construction the details or the plans or so on. No? And the actual work uh, in the for, in the first times all was made by himself. Yeah. But later on it was too uh, he was too busy with, with all things here. And these construction here we see here also the 40 foot uh, were all done by by people, by workers uh, who were engaged and and uh, uh, Got the constructional details, and they they made the wooden work and the mechanical work and and the optical work and so on and the polishing. Yes. Mm. That was a tool, or he, he developed tools you know, to to do things in short in short time. You know? Yeah. So it was all the constructive you know, uh, uh, matter. You know? mm. Well, well, Joe may, may may not. Well, she hasn't mentioned, but her husband has also built his own mirror grinding machine, mm -hmm. hasn't he, Joe? Pete Richardson, <laughs> which we hope to hear more about ourselves in a few months' time. 
Um, so I think, Joe, you know all about the, 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 the hard work involved in grinding your own mirrors. Um, so uh, yeah, a, a, a sort of question about the sweeps again from William um, Scoocher from the CD Astronomical Society. And I don't actually know what the acronym CD stands for, where in the country you are, William, but he says, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Were all the sweeps done at the lowest magnification? And if so, when were high magnifications used or higher? <laughs> Yes, in, in the, um, maybe 90% or, or even more were with the standard IPs of 157, no? uh, power of 157, and with this uh, field of view here, no? standard field of view. And uh, later on, uh, higher powers were used, and even sweeps were made with 300 or 320. No? But, uh, you know, uh, this field of view was much more narrow, it maybe half of the 15, no? yeah, or or even less for for the highest magnification. It was you know, the sweep bars get narrow and more narrow and narrow, and it was more difficult you know, to to sweep with these high magnitudes. Uh, but these were used to um, to get more detailed views. I have talked about this feature here. Yes, in the tracking no? mechanism, he he had a slide where two or three eyepieces were on the slide and he can could change the, the magnifications in very short time. And now there's a galaxy and you want to see, okay, is there any other or what are the detailed structures you put on the higher magnification and, and call out, shout it out uh, the descriptions uh, or what you see then. Huh? And uh, so things change, no? but only for a, a few objects, N not real sweeping with high magnitudes, but for more detailed studies. No? Mm. And I, I think the final question, probably uh, it's the last question that's actually in the chat box, um, must really go to Primula. Uh, she's asked, um, as Herschel misinterpreted a few objects, how long did it take him to realize that Uranus was a planet? <sighs> yes, in the first time he thought it was a comet, no? uh, and he told about a comet no? later, or, or a star or whatever, no? uh, but not a planet. Uh, he realized that it was a planet due to the orbital uh, calculations made by Lexell, for instance, or the people at Greenwich. And uh, then uh, he was aware it is a comet. And, uh, but uh, it was for long, for, for several years, uh, he, he called his objects uh, uh, Georgium Zidus, no? the star uh, attributed to, to George III. No? And uh, the comet idea was, was then uh, accepted by him, no? and he was aware that it was a comet. No? But in the first time, uh, he was not sure what it is. Uh, no, no, I, I, it's, it's ridiculous what I say. Now, a, a planet. No? Uh, first time he was was sure it was a comet, and later it was a planet due to the orbital uh, calculations. Then, uh, and he, he he accepted the, the planetary nature of of the object, no? and. Um, Yes, I, I don't know what was the real question. <laughs> uh, was it about planet and, and comet or? It, it, it was, uh, how long did it take him to, to ah, realize that, it, okay. that Uranus was a planet? Okay, uh, maybe a year, about a year. Uh, he, he got it in, in March, then it was too low and it was seen again in September by, by Bode and uh, by himself, uh, a week later or so, and uh, it, it was uh, shifted to the east. And it went from from Gemini towards towards uh, Cancer, and uh, yes, it it was it was an orbital motion, uh, obviously, no? too slow for a comet. This comet could could not uh, <laughs> being so slow and and with the same brightness. It was an illusion that that this is possible for such a cosmic object. So he she, he accepted, the, but it was lost because he it was seen in March 13, and he followed this until the end of April, and then it was too low in the in the west no, to be uh, uh, for continued observations. No? So it was at the same brightness, and that was still uh, was already unusual for for a comet. No? So he was not sure what what it really is, and the people at Greenwich uh, favored the, the planetary uh, idea from the beginning. Not, not, not Herschel, but later uh, he accepted this too, yes. Mm. 
No, absolutely fascinating stuff, Wolfgang. Like I, like I said, and and I, I've had a, a a nice comment from Charles Draper, actually, who's chairman of the Herschel Society. Yeah, I know him. I know him. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and he he just says he commented to me how how the sweet pattern is a reminiscent of of the Geyer observation patterns, which which you know. I, I think nicely places William, you know, this 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 man, huge dedication, mm -hmm. way ahead of his time. <laughs> yeah. And and you know, the immense contribution. And when will your book be published, um, Wolfgang? Do you know? I I, I know you were yeah. hoping it to be published by the middle of the year, but yes, it is in its final stage. Uh, I've just finished proofreading with uh, four of my favorite persons uh and now i'm um yes run through all the texts the last time and uh pick out the the uh, names of objects to to get uh indices and so on uh, for objects and subjects and persons and so on and to finish all the tables now which in the, are in the appendix or so on uh, and uh, and now i have about 600 pages yes about that and uh, yeah, this is a later work now for the next month or so. And then I go into publishing it by myself because you know, uh, books on demand, no, that's my choice. Ah, okay. Because it was not accepted by the Royal Astronomical Society. They were not interested. Even Herschel has its anniversary. <laughs> okay, that's, that's, not, that's yeah. not my problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I can only laugh about it. Okay. okay. Um, and uh, other other publishers uh, like Cambridge University Press were, well, yeah, they they went down from 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 things uh, concerning deep sky objects and so they had experience with that, not not always good and they so you know I, I we don't want it to publish because it may be a too too uh, small uh, numbers of of books to be printed or so no? mm. so i i do it by myself so i have the full control of the thing and as it's on the market as as every other book you no know, like amazon or whatever and uh, i'm pretty optimistic that a few op uh, books will be sold <laughs> but not yeah. the main that's the main not the main question it's it is a book that covers all these things and these things are, are presented for the first time and that's my my scope no? yeah well look we look forward to it so please let us know when it is published we'll yeah maybe in, in, in two uh, two or three months, uh, in, three in, months. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah fantastic fantastic well look th thank you so much you've had lots of, of complimentary comments in the chat um wolfgang mm -hmm. thank you so much for your time and and i've certainly enjoyed it and it's clear that, that everybody has it really was wonderful talk Thank you very much. And for the nice audience in the back, I only see uh, some people here. Ah, Charles. I yeah, found Charles here. <laughs> hi. <laughs> but not the rest. Uh, you, <laughs> oh, Owen is there. Owen, hi, hi. Uh, but um, do you know how many people are, are joining now uh, in the end? I think I, I think the numbers peaked at some 80 or so, Joe, mm -hmm. I seem to remember. Yeah, that's right. We had uh, a maximum of 80. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh, okay. So, I mean, that's a huge audience for an online talk, honestly, um, 80 people and, and it was a global audience. And I, I think it, it demonstrates, I hope it, it, it demonstrates the, 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 the contribution that you're making to our understanding of, of Herschel's um, mm -hmm. uh, observational career, really. Um, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Yes, Thank and you. the rest and the rest of the world can read my book in a few months. <laughs> and, and there's all about Uranus and all the things we have discussed here in the in the questions, and so are are explained in detail. You know? Great. And and I Great. hope my English is a, a bit better than my my talking English here. <laughs> yes, we, I, I have the proofreaders, and they they looked in in detail about my text, and so it's fine. It's fine. I think it's good. <laughs> no, your English was perfect, Wolfgang. So look. Thank you so much for talking to us and thanks everybody for joining from all over the world. Great yes. evening, really enjoyed it. So bye-bye yeah. everybody, thank you. Yeah, bye-bye from me, see you. Bye. <laughs>